I want to thank Denise and the Tappan Library for inviting me. My name is Evan Wiener, and for the next 45 minutes to an hour, we're going to be talking about uh, Germany and its history in the Olympics, particularly the Summer Olympics of 1936, better known as the Hitler Games, and the 1972 Munich Games, which is known as the Munich Massacre. The picture that you see here on the left is Avery Brundage. On the right is Judge Jeremiah Mahoney. And they butted heads starting in 1935 over whether or not the American team should actually show up in the summer of 1936 to compete in what is now known as the Hitler Games. Uh, Brundage was, of course, in favor of the American team going there. Mahoney wasn't. A little background here, 1931, the International Olympic Committee awarded the 1936 Summer Olympics to Berlin. Uh, the choice signaled Germany's return to the world community after its isolation in the aftermath of its defeat uh, in World War I in 1918. So 13 years pass and the International Olympic Committee says, hey, it's time to bring Germany back into the uh, family of nations. But in 1933, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany, and the Nazi Party was in control, and they turned the democracy into a one-party dictatorship that persecuted Jews, and Romas, or Gypsies, political opponents, lesbians, gays, and others who were undesirable, according to the Nazis. The Nazis also claimed to control all aspects of German life, and that included sports. The imagery of the 1930s of the German athlete was to promote the myth of Aryan racial superiority and physical prowess in sculpture and other forms. German artists idealized athletes' well-developed muscle tone and heroic strength and accentuated ostensibly Aryan facial features, the kind of features Adolf Hitler didn't have, or him, Eric Selig. Eric Selig was the light heavyweight boxing champion of the world back in 1933. In April 1933, an, an Aryans only policy was instituted in all German athletic organizations, non Aryans, Jews, or individuals with Jewish parents, and Romans, gypsies, were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. The German Boxing Association throughout the professional light heavyweight champion Eric Siegel in April 1933 for no other reason except he was Jewish. And then there was Daniel Preen. Daniel Preen was a member of the German Davis Cup tennis team and uh, he too was expelled in 1933 along with Gretel Bergman who was a world-class high jumper and maybe, just maybe, the best woman athlete in the world in 1933. She was expelled from her German club in 1933 and from the German Olympic team in 1936. But the Nazis overlooked Bergman until the very end because, um, well, for no explicable reason other than they overlooked her. They allowed her to continue and continue and continue. Uh, that's Ernest Jackney. He was uh, the former assistant uh, secretary of war for the United States, and he now, by 1935, is on the International Olympic Committee, or he is an International Olympic Committee delegate. Um, and he's expressing outrage because he's still getting reports as the former assistant uh, Navy secretary about what was really going on within Hitler's Germany. On November 25th, 1935, he sends a letter to the IOC president, Count uh, Henri Belay Latour. Now, when you look at the history of the International Olympic Committee, you'll find there's a lot of royalty or out of work royalty like counts and lords and sirs and earls and barons and all those people. Uh, Lord Killian, who ran the Olympics uh, in the mid 1970s. Anyway, uh, so this letter goes from Janke to uh, Latour and uh, Janke saying, hey, look, we can't go to the Olympics in 1936. Look at what is going on in Berlin. Uh, Jackney never got an answer to that letter. Latour was either too busy or didn't bother even reading it. The letter said, 
neither Americans nor the representatives of other countries can take part in the games in Nazi Germany without at least acquiescing to the contempt of the Nazis for fair play and their sordid exploitation of the games. The letter seemed to go unanswered. Probably was tossed. Jenke was the uh, former assistant secretary for the United States Navy. He was of German descent. And for uh, all of his uh, complaining, he gets thrown out of the exclusive club known as the International Olympic Committee by July 1936. And his spot is taken by Avery Brundage. December 8th, 1935, should have marked the turning point. Uh, if you go to the Holocaust Museum, in Washington, D.C., and you read the displays of people who uh, tried to help Jews in Germany or in other parts of Europe, uh, like Poland, Jeremiah Mahoney has a little special plaque about him because of what he did on December 8, 1935. Jeremiah Mahoney was the head of the AAU, and it was the AAU that accepted the invitation to go to perform at the 1936 Germany Olympics. That happened in 1933. It was also the AAU that uh, allowed or picked the athletes that competed in the 1936 Olympics. So Mahoney had an awful lot of power and he's teaming up with Janke and others saying, you can't go, you just can't go, you can't go. Why, why the concern? Because in 1933, the Aryans' only policy was instituted in uh, all German athletic organizations. Non-Aryans, Jews or individuals with Jewish parents or Romans or political opponents were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. This is what Mahoney had to say. There is no room for discrimination on the grounds of race, color, or creed in the Olympics. The AAU voted in 1933 to accept an invitation to compete at Berlin in 1936, provided Germany pledged that there would be no discrimination against Jewish athletes. If that pledge is not kept, I personally do not see why we should compete. And he would go off on a cross-country uh, speaking tour with others saying, don't go to Germany, don't go to Germany, don't go to Germany. But Franklin Roosevelt had different ideas. Roosevelt felt, it's okay, you can go, you can go, go, go ahead. I urge you to go to the Berlin Games. And one of the people who listened to Franklin Roosevelt, or two of the people who listened to Franklin Roosevelt, were from Brooklyn. Marty Glickman, an 18-year-old kid who was the fastest kid in Brooklyn, and 21-year-old Sam Stoller. Um, in this talk, there's something unique about this talk. I worked with Marty in the 1980s with his broadcasting school. I knew Sam Stoller. He ran the Milrose Games. And I interviewed Gretel Bergman in 1993. It's a unique perspective that I got from these people about Hitler, Berlin, and the 1936 Games. Marty wanted to go. Why do you want to go? To put that medal, to pick it up and shove it in the Fuhrer's face. That's what he wanted to do. Sam was quiet. Gretel told her story. Uh, it was a failure. Jackney and uh, um, Jeremiah Mahoney got nowhere. Uh, it was a failure. They're, they wanted to do something to call attention to Hitler. They couldn't do it with the boycott. Uh, but it was, there were people in the United States and Europe that did call for the boycott of the 1936 Olympics because of what is later known as human rights abuses. Uh, to this day, 2021, just recently, the former vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, in probably uh, a fundraiser or even an early campaign uh, mode for the 2024 presidential election, called on Joe Biden not to send American athletes to participate in the 2022 Beijing Olympics because of the situation with the Uyghurs, the human rights abuses, and also Pence wanted to know from China what they knew about the COVID-19 uh, virus and uh, how, it, how it happened, how it got into the mainstream. But Brundage had assurances from the Fuhrer. Assurances, everything is going to be good. Wasn't going to be any problem. Everybody will be treated with respect. 
a number of years ago, I gave a talk on this for the Stanford uh, JCC, and there was a guy about 90 years old uh, who was in the audience, and uh, he had graduated Columbia University. He was born in Germany, and his parents uh, got him to move to England in 1933 at the age of 13 because they were afraid of what was going to happen uh, in Germany. So uh, he was going back and forth visiting his parents. He said that uh, throughout the years, uh, 33, 34, 35, he was called all kinds of names. He was Jewish. But 1936, on the run-up to the Olympics, he went through uh, Berlin. No problem. No problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the games leave Berlin, and it was back to you dirty Jew and all that other stuff. Um, so, yeah, Brundage had assurances from Hitler and the, and the Nazi regime that everything was going to be okay, and that was good enough for him. Uh, the Nazis did turn it down by August of 1936. Uh, they tried to camouflage the violent racist policies while it hosted the Summer Olympics, like that guy in Stanford told me. He was about, oh, I don't know, at that point, uh, probably he was uh, about 85, maybe a little older than 85. Uh, most anti-Jewish signs were temporarily removed and newspapers toned down their harsh rhetoric. It's all an illusion. The Berlin Games, as presented to foreign spectators and journalists, was a false image of peaceful, tolerant Germany. Just a false image of that. But they tried, and they did convince some people. But Germany would end up with a propaganda coup. 49 nations sent teams to the Games which legitimized the Hitler regime, both in the eyes of the world and of German domestic audiences. First regular TV wasn't in the United States, wasn't in England. Oh yeah, there was a TV station in Schenectady, in New York in 1928. It was in the General Electric Laboratories. And uh, in 1933, um, there were TV shows on an experimental station in Chicago that nobody saw, but there were some TV shows. But the Nazis decided TV would be a great propaganda tool. And in 1935, they decided, let's start in Berlin and let's move to Hamburg and let's get people used to watching TV. Uh, the first regular electronic television service in Germany began in Berlin. That was March 22nd, 1935. It used the 180-line system. It was on the air for 90 minutes, three times a week. Uh, and it was being set up for the Olympics and to use the 1936 Olympics for propaganda purposes. The Nazis promoted an image of a new, strong, and united Germany while masking the regime's targeting of Jews and Romans or gypsies, political uh, opponents, uh, gay people, lesbians, and others that they found uh, were, were beneath contempt or or, or they couldn't deal with them, and they had to get rid of them, as well as uh, Germany's growing militarism. It would be Jesse Owens who would steal the show in 1936 by winning four gold medals. Jesse Owens was depicted in uh, German newspapers as a monkey. As a monkey, that's all he was. He wasn't worth anything else. Um, and uh, he really you know, stuck it to the Nazis. During the 1936 Olympics on television, there were broadcasts up to eight hours a day, and they took place in Berlin and Hamburg, but ultimately television did fail in Nazi Germany, at least in 1936. Uh, it was supposed to be used for propaganda, but television set sales never increased, and television was not really accessible to most Germans, only a few number of viewers, and eventually Germany would scrap the whole idea. It's Marty Glickman on the left, Sam Stoller on the right. That's this kid in Brooklyn, Marty Glickman. Work with him. If you ever uh, ran into Marty and talked to Marty and asked him about the Olympics, he would say, may that Avery Brundage rot in hell for the rest of eternity. You talk to Sam, wouldn't say anything. Wouldn't say anything about it. Uh, it's the 1936 Olympics. Marty has made the team. Sam has made the team. They're fast. And uh, they're supposed to be on the track in Berlin. But uh, day before the event, they were replaced by Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. The amazing thing about Owens being on this team, yeah, he was one of the two fastest sprinters along with Metcalf. 
was that uh, Jesse had no idea how to handle a baton. And when you're running a relay, you got to take the baton and you got to hand off the baton. In a sense, the Americans might have been sabotaging their chance to win a gold medal by using Jesse Owens, who had no idea how to use a baton. Eventually, he did. Uh, the coaches, led by Dean Cromwell, claimed um, they needed their fastest runners to win the race, something that Marty Glickman vehemently disagreed with. Glickman said uh, that the coach, Dean Cromwell and Avery Brundage, in his mind, were motivated by anti-Semitism and the desire to spare the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, the embarrassment of the sight of two American Jews on the winning podium. All Marty wanted to do was take that medal and go like that, shove it in the Fuhrer's face. Meanwhile, Sam didn't think it was anti-Semitism, but in his diary, talking about uh, being benched, uh, he described it as the most humiliating episode in his life. Sam, or rather, uh, Marty, Marty in his book, we were shocked. Sam was completely stunned. He didn't say a word at the meeting. I was a brash 18-year-old kid. And I said, coach, can't hide world-class sprinters. At which point, Jesse spoke up and said, coach, I've won my three gold medals, the 100, 200, and the long jump. I'm tired. I've had it. Let Marty and Sam run. They deserve it. 1936 America, or 1936 American team in Berlin, Jim Crow. Jim Crow was going strong at that point. Uh, and Cromwell, according to Marty, pointed his finger at Jesse Owens and said, you'll do as you're told. Those days, black athletes, Negro athletes, did as they were told. Jesse was quiet after that. Uh, in 2021, that shouldn't be a problem, except there is a problem at the Olympics. It's called Rule 50, which prohibits athletes from protesting, political protests. Although this entire 1936 Olympics was a political protest. So there uh, is Metcalf next to Jesse Owens is there on the left and uh, Draper and Wolkoff stayed on. They weren't cut. Marty and Sam were. It was supposed to be Marty, Sam, Draper, and Wyckoff. Wyckoff and Draper stayed. Um, Marty was very upset. Marty thought, well, maybe I'll get a chance in 1940. Didn't. 1944. Didn't. Too old in 1948. Same with Sam. They never got a chance again. Meanwhile, uh, back in 1993, uh, I was working for, working for Mutual Radio. And there was a United States Olympic Committee. Uh, they, had a, uh, they had a bash at the New York Athletic Club and they were honoring all sorts of Olympic athletes, including Bullet Bob Hayes, who um, was once the fastest human in the United States. And as he told me that day, he's the slowest human in the United States. Um, he was there, a lot of other Olympians there as well. Hayes, of course, played with the Dallas Cowboys eventually. Gretel Bergman was there, and there was a little small talk before we started, and the PR people turned to me and Marsh Schneider, and I believe Bruce Morton was there and a couple others, and we were going to do a radio, a radio interview with her. And uh, I had known the story about Gretel Bergman. Gretel Bergman was kicked off the, uh, or at least thrown out of her training facilities in 1933, but she continued to train and train and train and train until she couldn't train anymore, which was two weeks before the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Um, she had equaled uh, the German women's record in the high jump, and uh, it was a good chance she was going to win a gold medal. But uh, Germany decided two weeks prior to the Olympics that Gretel didn't have the right stuff to make the Olympics. So... Uh, we're all standing around and the PR guy says, okay, your turn. And um, usually Marv, who was older than me, allowed me to ask the first question. And um, I'm with Gretel Bergman and I just have a one word question, why? And she came prepared with the answer. There was Gretel Bergman at the uh, height of uh, her prime uh, athletically back in the 1930s. And she said, that was a great Jewish hope. You got to understand something. You have to understand something. All of our rights were taken away day by day by day by day. Our 
businesses or right to go to school or homes. We were nobodies. We were nobodies. But I was still out there. I was still out there. And I figured I may be able to give my people, my people, a glimmer of hope, an absolute glimmer of hope. That's all I wanted to do. It's a glimmer of hope. Uh, Gretel Bergman was only 23 years old at that time. She's one glimmer of hope. Uh, but she doesn't make the team. And she gets treated like every other Jew in Germany after that, uh, terribly. She was, uh, had a friend at the time, boyfriend by the name of Dr. Bruno Lambert, also um, an athlete. And in 1937, they decide it's all over for us in Germany. We're out of here. And they were able to obtain proper papers and get sponsorship in the United States. And the two of them immigrated to the United States. Uh, both of them landed in Ellis Island. They had $20 between them because you could take no more than $10 out of Germany. That's all the Germans would allow you to take out of the country. She would work as a masseuse, work as a housemaid, and later as a physical therapist. And even though she wasn't a citizen in 1937, she made the U.S. national team in track and field. Uh, and she did so in 1938. And she would win the 1937 and 1938 U.S. Women's High Jump Championships, in addition to the 1937 Shot Put Championship. She would marry Dr. Bruno Lambert in 1938. She would become a United States citizen in 1942, but she would never, ever appear in the Olympics. That dream was taken away. She would fade into obscurity for years and years and years, nearly four decades of obscurity until she's introduced into the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame at the Wingate Institute in Israel. And then people started to take a second look at Gretel Bergman. What was she? Who was she? Why was she so great? And for years and years and years after that, she went around giving talks about uh, what happened in Nazi Germany, why she wasn't on the team. And she got around to me and Marv and Bruce and the others in 1993 at the New York Athletic Club. Her legacy, she won a gold medal in 1996. I said she won a gold medal because, yeah, she won a gold medal. As the International Olympic Committee awarded her a gold medal 60 years after, 60 years after, she should have won a gold medal at the 1936 Olympics. Uh, HBO, Ross Leventhal, uh, rather Ross Levinson and uh, Fuchs, uh, Levinson and Fuchs, who ran HBO back in those days, HBO Sports, were after her. They wanted her to go back to Germany so they could do a special. She told me and Marvin and, and the others who were there, she was never going back to Germany. She never bought a Ford. She never bought a Mercedes Benz. Her, she was an American. As far as she's concerned, that was all wiped out. But eventually, uh, Ross and Fuchs did get her to go to uh, Germany in 1999, and she went to the stadium where she trained in Latham, and she told old stories about uh, growing up in Germany, and she found out that the stadium was renamed in her honor. The HBO special, which was called Hitler's Pawn, H-I-T-L-E-R-H-V-S-P-A-W-N, don't know if it's available in the library. You might want to check with Denise. That one may not be available in the library. But anyway, uh, it was an HBO special in 2004. She passed away at the age of 103 in 2017. There were some, uh, there was one German, actually there were two German Jews that uh, appeared in the 1936 Olympics. One of them was a guy by the name of Rudolf Ball. He was in the Winter Games in Munich. He was an ice hockey player. Uh, and he cut a deal with the Nazis. He said, yeah, I'll play for you, but, but here's the deal. I'll play on the team, but you let me and my family out of here once the games were over. The Nazis lived up to that. Rudolf Ball and his family left Germany. Meyer is an interesting uh, study in that uh, she was a fencer and her father was Jewish. Her mother was not Jewish. That made her a non-Aryan because she had Jewish blood through her father. But the German authorities allowed the star fencer, Helene Mayer, to represent Germany at the Olympic Games in the summer of 36. She would win a silver medal in the women's individual fencing competition. And like all other medalists for Germany, she gave the Nazi salute on the podium. 
No other Jewish athlete competed for Germany in the 1936 Summer Games. We don't know very much about Helene Meyer. She died at the age of 42, which is rather young. She didn't leave much correspondence, very little correspondence, not very much uh, to go on in terms of her life. There are no film clips of her talking about the time. There were, you know, they, they could have been a crew that uh, around then that could have interviewed her, but there's no, there's no film of that. She never wrote a book, but she would flee to California of all places. She fled to California, and nobody knows why, but she fled to California. In 2000, when Sports Illustrated was a legitimate magazine, it's not today, there's no money in it, it keeps changing hands, uh, but when it was a legitimate magazine back in 2000, Sports Illustrated named Mayer the greatest fencer of the 20th century. And there is Adolf Hitler congratulating somebody after winning the Olympics, but he didn't congratulate him. In fact, he turned his back on Jesse Owens. Um, because he was embarrassed. Remember, the local German newspapers portrayed Jesse Owens as a monkey, as a monkey. Jesse Owens would go back to the United States, but he wasn't a conquering hero. He didn't go to the White House. In fact, he couldn't even get a job after his performance at the Olympics. The legacy of the 1936 Olympics? Well, Adolf Hitler hoped that the 1936 Berlin Games would prove his theory of Aryan racial superiority. Jesse Owens destroyed that. Owens won four gold medals in the 100 meter, 200 meter, four by 100 meter relay and the long jump. He set three world records along the way. One of those records in the four by 100 relay, which he never was supposed to run. He takes the place of Marty Glickman or Sam Stoller with Ralph Metcalf taking the place of the other two. Um, and he was part of that world-shattering time uh, team. And maybe Cromwell was right. He needed speed. But uh, Marty said that he and Sam could have taken care of that as well. There were nine athletes who were Jewish or of Jewish parentage who won medals in the Nazi Olympics, including Mayer, and five Hungarians. One of those Hungarians, a fencer by the name of Indy, would be killed in a concentration camp. Several Jewish male athletes from the United States, seven Jewish male athletes, including Marty and Sam, uh, went to Berlin. They were under enormous pressure not to go. But Marty said he had a purpose. He was going to stick it in the Fuhrer's face. Sam never told me what his purpose was. Uh, and they got pressured from Jewish organizations. Don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. They went. And Sam was humiliated. Some of the uh, athletes who were killed in concentration camps included this guy, Roman Cantor, a fencer. Uh, many Jewish athletes who competed in the Olympics prior to 1936, whether it was 28 or 32, or the 1936 Olympics itself would die in concentration camps during the Holocaust. Among them, uh, Ija Sebrin, who was a Polish swimmer, and Roland Cantor, uh, Roman Cantor, who was a Polish fencer. Uh, both competed in 1936, and both would die at uh, Majdanek. The two specials you should see on the 1936 Olympics were both done by HBO. Bergman, Hitler's pawn, Gretel Bergman, and Justin Glickman. That was it, Glickman, who might have, uh, might have been connected with HBO at the time I was working uh, with him with his uh, broadcast school uh, back in the late 1980s. Here's a guy you probably never heard of, Wolfgang Frontzner. He ran the Olympic Village, and he was a Nazi. He was the vice commander of Berlin's Olympic Village during the 1936 Summer Olympics, but he committed suicide, pistol shot to the head, uh, on August 19, 1936, three days after the end of the Games. Why did he kill himself? Well, it was found out that uh, he had Jewish blood in him killed himself. Couldn't deal with either the embarrassment or thought uh, that he better kill himself for other reasons. Now, there was appeasement by the International Olympic Committee. That is Neville Chamberlain, the uh, British uh, prime minister who uh, was looking for peace in the late 1930s with Hitler 
probably didn't get it or didn't get it, but uh, the appeasement policy. And the Olympics had an appeasement policy as well. Sapporo, Japan was the original choice for the 1940 Winter Games. Uh, they had been selected for the honor in 1937, but that was the same year that the Sino-Japanese War broke out. And the International Olympic Committee, well, they couldn't put the game in games or the games in, uh, in a war zone, if that was going to become a war zone. Uh, the Sino-Japanese War might have been a war zone in Sapporo. Uh, so they go to Switzerland and they reach out to Sam Moritz. They, they ran or they had the 1928 Winter Olympics, but Switzerland said no. So they're looking and looking and looking, and time is running out. Winter of 1940, and this is already June of 1939, they don't have a site. But uh, they go back to the Germans, they go back to the Nazis, and they say, uh, how about Munich? Can we have Munich for the 1940 Winter Olympics? The IOC overlooked the fact that the Germans had invaded Austria. It was seven months after Kristallnacht. It was uh, less than three months uh, since the German troops invaded bits of Czechoslovakia. IOC didn't care. They needed to put the, the a Winter Olympics somewhere, and they did in Munich. Oh, not only that, there's Benito Mussolini in Italy. They're looking for a Winter Olympics in 1944. Hey, why not Italy? War is going on, you know, but why not Italy? Um, Germany's ally and the IOC awarded the 1944 Winter Olympics to Cortina in Mussolini's Italy. Uh, neither of the, uh, of the two 1940 Olympics, uh, the Winter and the Summer Games, nor the uh, two in 1944, the Winter and Summer Games, took place because of World War II. 1939, Germany invaded Poland. No Olympics for Marty, no Olympics for Sam, no Olympics for Gretel in 1940 and 44, and for most people uh, in 1936, except for this guy, Alfred Nakichi, French swimmer, Jewish French swimmer, and he made it back to the Olympics. Uh, Nakichi competed for France in the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. He came in fourth as part of a four by 200 meter relay team, missing a bronze medal by just six seconds. In 1941, in uh, competitions that were still going on, despite the fact there was a war going on, he set a world record for the 200-meter breaststroke, beating the German champion on the way. As a Jewish swimmer, he attracted criticism and was restricted from entering races. Um, the criticism, why are you doing this? Um, the restriction from races, well, he found some allies because some of Fran France's leading swimmers withdrew themselves in protest at his Nakachi's treatment. 1944, June of 1944, he, his wife, and the two-year-old daughter are all arrested and deported to Auschwitz. 1,368 men, women, and children made the journey to that concentration camp. Only 47 survived. Uh, his wife and daughter both died, but he survived. Less than a year after the liberation of Buchenwald, he was part of the French team that set a world record in the three by 100 meter relay. That year, he also became the French national champion at the butterfly and in the four by 100 meter relay. So he gets to go to London in 1948. He gets to go to London. And he does rather well. Not bad for a guy who's in the concentration camp, a guy who was older. Uh, in London, he swam in the 200-meter breaststroke, reaching the semifinals. He also uh, played a part, or what had, was part, uh, of the French uh, water polo team. 1972, terrorism comes into your living room in the United States for the first time ever. These 11 people were killed during the Munich massacre, 1972, September 1972. The massacre, like I said, first time the terrorism went into your living room, Jim McKay over at ABC provided excellent, excellent, excellent coverage. And he got some help from Peter Jennings. And of course, Howard Gussell was there. Howard once told me, and he, not Jim McManus, should have been the anchor of the newscast. You know what? 
the case should have been. Howard might have started a world war. Um, Howard was uh, Howard was Howard, uh, although he did have a part. Howard, by the way, was six foot three. In case you didn't notice that, he was a tall guy. And he was tough as nails as well. He was a lawyer, and he was also a staff sergeant in the Marines back in uh, around 1944. The massacre, well, that was uh, the work of the Black September terrorist group. The Day of Terror began at 4:30. Uh, in the morning, Munich time, September 5th, 1972, when eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September, a militant offshoot of the Palestinian group Fatar, which had ties to the Palestinian Liberation Organization of Yasser Arafat, scaled the fence surrounding the Olympic Village of Munich. Uh, before I get into uh, a little more about this, let's talk about Black September just briefly. Um, Black September. That group was in Jordan in 1970, and they tried to assassinate King Hussein twice in 1970. Hussein declared war on the group that was living in Jordan. They said uh, that uh, this is the Palestinian homeland, Jordan, you got to give it to us. Uh, after this assassination attempts and other things, the Jordanian army went after them. Uh, Black September did have an ally in the Syrian Air Force. Uh, but that wasn't much of a help. Uh, the Syrian Air Force was virtually destroyed by the Jordanians, and uh, Black September was on the run until 1971, when there was a uh, treaty brokered, and um, they were able to go to Lebanon through Syria. They went to Syria and into Lebanon. Uh, they were disguised as athletes using stolen keys, and they forced their way into the quarters of the Israeli Olympic team. At about 10 o'clock on September 5th, which was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, New York time on September 5th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Los Angeles, German authorities believed they reached an agreement with the terrorists. The terrorists led their bound and blindfolded hostages from their quarters into buses that transported them to waiting helicopters. They were headed to a German airfield. And there is Jim McKay, who basically was told Hey, Jim, get a jacket, get a, get a shirt, get a tie, sit down, we're going to shoot you from the waist up, you're going to be the guy telling America what is going on in Munich, Germany. And he did a fantastic job, an absolute fantastic job. He can't say enough about him, even though it is now, what, uh, 49 years later? He just did a, he did um, what a journalist should do. Uh, on September 6th, that's Munich time, 12.30 at night, 4.30 New York time, the shooting stopped. The 20-hour reign of terror is over. 11 Israelis had been killed along with one Munich policeman. Five black September terrorists lay dead. Three of the gunmen were captured. At 3 a.m. local time, 9 o'clock New York time, McKay, who had been broadcasting from the Olympic Village now for 14 straight hours, summarized the tragic outcome of the botch rescue with the words, they're all gone. I almost worked with Jim McKay about 25 years ago. We were going to work on the radio show together. And Jim said, why do I need this? Why do I need this? I should be retired. I don't need the day-to-day -day grind of the radio show which for me was unfortunate, but Jim was a really nice guy and uh, he deserved his retirement. Uh, you know, I don't have any hard feelings about it. It's broadcasting, these things happen. You think you got the greatest thing going and somebody says it's not and it's over. But uh, Jim McKay got a letter from Walter Cronkite who said, you did our profession proud. The German authorities never did storm building 31. They allowed the terrorists to take the hostages by helicopter to a nearby military base. There, the Germans planned an ambush and rescue operation. It was badly bungled. In fact, it was bungled terribly, and the 11 Israelis were killed. Nine of the, uh, nine of the Israeli hostages were killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire and a hand grenade that one of the Palestinians set off in the helicopter as it sat on the ground. There is Howard. Howard was part of this back in Munich. We have an immense flurry of action here, Cosell told Peter Jennings. Police in platoon-like numbers are staging in front of us. Howard was part of it. So is he, Richard Nixon. Oh, oh. Richard Nixon, 
who uh, I got to meet and know in 1985. Uh, he was chosen as the person who was going to arbitrate the Major League Baseball umpires dispute with the Major League owners, uh, and he awarded the uh, umpires a sizable raise. Uh, with that action, he was uh, welcomed back into polite society um, as a senior statesman, and I got to know him over about three or four year period because I'd see him periodically, and I would call him president, or uh, the first time I saw him socially, I said, uh, hello, Mr. Uh, president Nixon. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, call me Dick. Call me Dick. And after that, he was just Dick Nixon to me. Nixon in the telegram demanded that the rest of the games be called off. But Avery Brundage, who was the International Olympic Committee, and the International Olympic Committee was him, held a pep rally, basically said the games must go on. At a memorial service on September 6th, Brundage announced that the games would continue. Uh, he once said that uh, the 1936 Berlin Games was the finest ever. Brundage would be a central character in German Olympics history. Another guy I spoke to in, uh, when I was working uh, in the 1990s, and this was uh, at this point for an outfit called Olympic Broadcasting, Olympia Broadcasting, rather, out of St. Louis, and we were doing short form and long form programming with uh, Bob Costas there. Uh, John Madden, who I work with, was there. Pat O'Brien was there and uh, a number of others. Anyway, uh, I work with John uh, basically, and I worked a little with Bob, but not all that much. Uh, but enough to uh, that he knew my name and I knew his name, Bob Costas. Anyway, Mark Spitz uh, wins seven gold medals in the Munich Olympics. And uh, American security is getting a little worried about him because he's a Jewish American and he might be a high value target for other terrorists. So they whisk him out of there as quickly as they can uh, to London. A news conference that was celebrating Spitz's achievements was hurriedly canceled. This is Mark Spitz talking. This is not me talking. This is Mark Spitz from part of the interview I did with him in 1999. The swimming program had stopped, said Switz, Spitz, rather. The swimming program had stopped. Uh, too bad we can't edit that out. But anyway, uh, I swam all of my events, and that evening, the last day of competition, was on a Monday, and this happened Tuesday on a morning. Swimming was through, so I didn't have to compete anymore. Had a press conference right afterwards on Tuesday, and that's when everyone told me about this Israeli tragedy or the thing that was happening at the time. It hadn't turned into a major tragedy at the moment, at least at that time. They didn't know much about it. The next day, I was whisked away, and he was safely tucked into the United States. No problem. Uh, Brundage uh, offers this bizarre 27-word tribute to our Israeli friends. Oh, yeah, the games must go on. And they would. Uh, Brundage, who was the IOC, ordered the competition resume after a 34-hour pause. Uh, Cosell once described... Uh, uh, Avery Brundage is uh, being a man of the time of William of Orange. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was in Delft, which is in uh, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, William of Orange's hometown was Delft. And I took this picture uh, of the William of Orange, or William Van Orange Grand Cafe, and I sent it to some of uh, Cosell's grandchildren. And uh, Justin, his uh, oldest of the grandchildren, laughed. He just said, oh, 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 you really knew Papa well, because he used to tell us that all the time. Avery Brothage came of age during the time of William of Orange. 1976 Olympics, Summer Olympics in Montreal, the Israeli team remembered what happened in 72. The IOC didn't. The team entered the stadium at the Olympic ceremony with a black ribbon on the national flag. The International Olympic Committee never acknowledged the massacre officially and in 2012 refused to honor the slain athletes and coaches at the London Summer Olympics on the 40th anniversary of the attack, which got Bob Costas extremely upset. And Bob Costas went off on the International Olympic Committee as the NBC commentator, something you would never expect from the host uh, of the uh, United States coverage of the Olympics, saying that uh, these people were wrong in not doing this. Now, I have a theory as to why Bob went off on that. Um, NBC is owned by Comcast. Comcast has the rights to the Olympics until 
2032, and they're paying the International Olympic Committee billions upon billions of dollars. Uh, the company was founded by the Roberts family. The Roberts family still owns them. Brian Roberts is the head of Comcast, also NBC, uh, USA Network, CNBC, the uh, NBC Sports Network, which is going out of business, Peacock. Uh, platforms, all those platforms that are doing this year's Olympics. Uh, Brian Roberts, he has them in the United States. And uh, in 2011, he and his family competed in the Maccabee Games in Israel. So uh, I, my theory is, I've never asked Bob about it, not that Bob would ever tell me, my theory is that Costas cleared it with Brian Roberts, knowing full well that the Olympic Committee would be very, very upset, but Costas did it anyway. At long last, the year is 2016, and there's some closure to the 1972 Olympics. There is Thomas Bach, presently the International Olympic Committee president, hugging two of the widows of uh, the uh, Israeli 11. Uh, the International Olympic Committee president, Thomas Bach, led a mourning ceremony, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, at the 2016 Rio Games for the 11. Israeli athletes and coaches slain by Palestinian terrorists at the 1972 Olympics. A tribute that a widow of one of the victims said brought a closure for the families. There was Bach signing the proclamation. But like everything else in the Olympics or the International Olympic Committee, it wasn't all that it seemed. See, um, they had many, many years to honor these people and never did. But when they decided to honor these people, they made it all Olympians or coaches uh, connected to the Olympics who were killed. This included one loser from the country of Germany who was killed in Vancouver uh, in a practice run. Um, the Olympics wanted speed. He was going to try to give them speed. He was honored as well. So it was 12 in all, not the Israeli 11, 12 in all. And probably because uh, the International Olympic Committee did not want to upset other countries and delegations. Germany has never held another Olympics, the two in 1936, the one in 1972. And uh, that's the JCC up the road from you uh, in uh, West Nyack, the Rockland JCC, and that's their tribute. That is their tribute to the 1972 Israeli athletes. Germany has quite the history in the Olympics. Uh, oh, one other thing. Uh, Germany was bidding for the 2022 Winter Olympics, the city of Munich and uh, the Bavarian area. Um, there was a vote by, uh, there was a, a, a referendum uh, in the area and Munich and Bavaria and the uh, residents didn't want any part of the Olympics, didn't want to uh, put up money for the Olympics. And uh, one of the Munich officials said, this was the Munich massacre. Hmm. I don't think so. They just didn't get the Olympics. Uh, Hamburg uh, dropped out of the bidding for the 2024 Olympics. Uh, and that's the Olympic history of Germany. Anyway, uh, thank you, Denise, for inviting me. Thank you, the Tappan Library. My name is Evan Wiener. Uh, we will see you again in August. Um, thank you so much, Denise, for inviting me. I hope uh, people uh, learned something from the presentation. And uh, we will uh, be back next month. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay healthy. And uh, we will see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.